This week on CrossFeed, Pat Robertson, how do you sell profit? The Ten Commandments in Florida. Heather has two moms and a dad. King, Brown, and Jesus. See the resemblance? And communist spies in the Polish church. A global podcast, if ever there was one. I'm Pastor Jim Butler, Pastor of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. And I'm Pastor Dale Christley, Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. It's good to have you with us. And uh, good to see you again, Dale. Greetings, Professor. Likewise. And How's your week? Much calmer. Much smoother. <laughs> much simpler. So in that respect, it's been very good. Yeah, well, my week overall has been all right. Although, right after we recorded the last episode, now, just for our listeners and viewers, the way that we do this is Jim records it on his end, and then he sends it to me uh, through iChat, uh, peer-to-peer connection. And it started coming, and it got about halfway or so, and it just stopped. And I couldn't figure out what the problem was, and it failed. He had to send it to me again the next day because he sent it overnight. And what I figured out was my hard drive had died. It was my external drive is where it was going. Well, that external drive is also the drive where my entire iTunes library is. Mm. And so I have about half of it on my iPod. And there is software you can get to to copy that back over. The rest of it is either on CDs or um, stuff that I got from eMusic.com, stuff that I got from the iTunes Music Store, uh, you know, just kind of all over the place, free downloads and, and that. And so I've got, uh, um, I'm in the process of switching computers, and, and once I do that, um, I'm going to have some work to do to try and restore my iTunes library. I'm a bit frustrated right now. So <laughs> it's back up your stuff. <laughs> yeah, but that's what the external Take hard it. drives to do, to back it up. I mean, what, what the backup is <laughs> Yeah, bad, unfortunately, but. it was my only copy. And since my iPod is not big enough to, to keep everything, you know, it, if I had a, a big enough drive on my iPod, I could just have, I could just restore from the iPod and I'd have it all there. But I have selected playlists because I have more stuff in my iTunes library than what will actually fit on my iPod. So, mm. so that's my week. <laughs> Get used to disappointment. Well, speaking of catastrophes, um, Pat Robertson. My donkey senses are tingling all over. Oh, this is a transition for you. Um, and not speaking about Pat Robertson himself necessarily, um, but something he's added again with the predictions. He predicted a horrific terrorist act in the United States that was result in mass killing in late 2007. So um, he says, I'm not necessarily saying it's going to be nuclear. Um, the Lord didn't say nuclear, but I do believe it will be something like that. That was pointless. So... This is the same guy that said um, that in January 2004, President George W. Bush would easily win re-election. It's 51%. I don't know how you can say that easily. And uh, in 2005, he said that Bush would have victory after victory in his second term. He said Social Security reform proposals would be pro- would be approved and Bush would nominate conservative judges to federal courts. Well, he got the judges to federal courts thing with Roberts and Alito, but Social Security form, uh uh-uh, wrong on that one. And uh, he also predicted that um, in May of, of this past year, he said that God told him that storms and possibly a tsunami, and we reported on this one, 
were to crash into America's coastline in 2006. All right, well, Jim, you're pretty close to America's coastline. Do you guys have a tsunami? <laughs> Not that I saw. Um, yeah, I'm about... Um, what? 10 miles from the coastline. Um, no, we're not too far. No, I mean, but we did get a lot of rain. It was a very wet right, summer right. up here. So, so he says, well, it was partially fulfilled because of all the rain. Which, you know, just indicates, you know, he's a false prophet. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I, I like this. Sometimes I hit and sometimes I miss, he said. Well, unfortunately, if this is God speaking, God doesn't hit and miss. Yeah, that's one of the amazing things about prophecy in the Bible. Uh, uh, when the prophets do say this is going to happen in the future, it's exactly what happens. Matter yeah. of fact, that's why... Every detail. It, every detail, which is why, you know, back in the... During the Enlightenment, the, they, they said this couldn't have been predicted prophecy. It had to be somebody who wrote it then. Because who would be able to predict this kind of detail? Yeah. And so, you know, it had to be a contemporary person reporting at it and then saying, writing as if he was predicting it. And, and, Which and, we now know that that wasn't the case just by further studies of the literature. And, I, you know, there, there's even a story, and, and I don't know if this one's true, but it just demonstrates how detailed it was that, um, that there was uh, one of Alexander the Great's servants um, showed him the book of Daniel and pointed out to him the part that talked about him. And there's the, the statue with the different kinds of parts, and, and part of that refers to the empire that, um, that Alexander the Great would establish. And it goes into great detail about it. And, uh, you know, Alexander, instead of seeing it and repenting, um, because he was uh, basically a secular humanist, um, he instead got all full of himself and went, oh, I guess I'm pretty important. Of course, he didn't read the whole thing about how um, it, it would end up being divided up, um, not to his descendants and, and stuff like that. So, you know, we're talking just amazing detail in Scripture. And, like I said, every single prediction has came true in every detail. I did not know that. All right. Robertson hits and misses. So, and, you know, that's how you know if it's true or not. Uh, you know, how do you know if the Bible's true? And I, I just heard some debating about it um, this past week on another podcast I was listening to. And, um, and, it, and they said, oh, well, you know, it's just, it's a book. How can you, um, you know, lead your life or whatever by a book? Or, but, well, prophecy, 100% accurate even though the prophecies were written over a period of 1,500 years. I mean, that's a pretty good track record. So, you know, that's something that I find, you know, when I find myself in doubt, when I find myself saying, boy, you know, this is God in the flesh and, you know, raising the dead and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes I really struggle with that. But then all I have to do when I find myself struggling with that is I just grab a Bible, I look up, I read Psalm 22 again, I read Isaiah 53, and, and just all the different, I mean, not all, it generally doesn't take me too long to snap out of it, but I mean, there's all these detailed prophecies that there's just, I mean, you know, that's one of the reasons that a lot of people think that part of um, Isaiah was written after the fact, because he actually mentions Cyrus by name. What could happen? And they go, oh, well, how could he have known that? Somebody must have added that in later. Well, no, actually, it's a coherent whole. So. It is. But since Pat Robertson can make his predictions, uh, Jim and I are going to make some predictions for 2017. Right? And uh, I'm not going to claim that these came from God, though. I, I I just don't have that kind of audacity. All right, but my first prediction for 2007, Pat Robertson will make more ridiculous predictions. My first prediction, and I think this will come true, 
the release of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows will set sales records. <laughs> right. My next prediction, more churches will start preaching on global warming instead of Jesus. Maybe the human race deserves to be wiped out. My prediction, Apple will make history with the release of the iPhone. Um, that one already happened. Cool. Oh, it hasn't been released yet. <laughs> I, think we I guess it hasn't been released yet. So, okay. Um, all right, next prediction. As embryonic stem cells are harvested, now they, can, um, they found a way to do it from placentas and amniotic mm-hmm. fluid instead of destroying embryos, the entire debate will slowly fade away. It's not going to just you know, vanish overnight. But eventually, within about a year or so, the debate will be gone. Nobody will be arguing about it anymore because it'll be a moot point. The battle for Helm's Deep is over. My prediction, the Democrats will keep complaining about George Bush. (laughs) All right. My next prediction, more churches will leave the Episcopal Church and the Archbishop of Canterbury will continue to have no comment on it until late 2007 or possibly even later than that. We're in trouble. Uh, my prediction is, and I'm not sure this one will come true, but this will be a sign of the apocalypse if it does. The <laughs> Chicago Cubs will take the World Series in 2008. <laughs> oh boy, well... If you get that one, we might actually have to declare you a prophet. (laughs) All right, my next one. The movie release of Christ the Lord out of Egypt, based on the Anne Rice book, will tank at the box office. Get used to disappointment. Okay, my prediction? Spider-Man 3 will set sales records for tickets at the movie theater. All right. Al Sharpton will continue to be more involved in politics than theology. And speaking of our boy Al, that's probably going to happen too. But speaking of our boy Al, he just said one of the most interesting things I've ever heard, and that is, of course, that <clears throat> there's a big relationship uh, or, or resemblance between Jesus and James Brown. I think he's been watching that Color of the Cross movie. Yeah, it, uh, I don't know, this is kind of an odd thing. He, uh, he said, both of them brought joy, both of them brought happiness, both of them brought all kinds of things. I'm not quite sure how Jesus' relationship to James Brown, you know, when he had this drug-fueled confrontation with police that ended a car chase. I think the resemblance may end there, I'm not sure. Well, but, okay, James Brown um, allegedly um, beat his wife. Now, if you if you uh, believe in the Da Vinci Code stuff, that he was married, and we could, we could probably make a connection that way if we really stretch it. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. I mean... That was pointless. You know, it just struck me on those weird, bizarre parallels that some of these guys make sometimes. I mean, I remember the one, you know, one of those Easter sermon. There must be something in the water in New York. It's another New York pastor. And he said, you know, that that the pilot of the United States was beating the Jesus of Nicaragua, you know. This is a little weird. This one struck me as the same thing. Of course, Al Sharpton, you know, I mean... He's an interesting buddy that he is. He, uh, 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 I mean, I remember watching him in the Democratic debates three years ago. He's probably the most colorful guy there. The others would be so serious. And he'd, be, he'd be flipping off lines right and left. He was fun. <laughs> you know, I just, I read this and I, I, I was just, I was really, aside from being completely ridiculous, I was really saddened by it. You know, here's an opportunity to, I mean, this is going to be reported all over. This is James Brown. All right. So he's preaching his funeral. There's all these reporters taking, keeping note of what he's saying. All right. 
here's this opportunity to say, you know what? James Brown made lots of people happy. He, he was a very talented person, but you know what? He wasn't perfect, and we all know it. But that's the amazing grace of God. So no matter what you've done, he's forgiven. Mm-hmm. That That's why Jesus came, to die for us, to forgive our sins, and to give us the assurance through his resurrection that we will one day rise too. You know, he could have said that. Get used to disappointment. But, mm, no. But, uh, but this happens a lot with celebrity funerals. You know, I remember, you know, when Jim Henson died, and he was at the, you know, Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York, and he had Big Bird standing up dancing in front of the altar and singing. You know, and I'm just like, what is this? Um, there was, um, Christianity Today had some reports from different uh, people, you know, talking about uh, uh, President Ford's funeral. You know, and, mm-hmm. you know, that there probably wasn't enough Jesus in it. And they, some people said there could have been more with, with, with the gospel. Others said it's better than other, you know, funerals they've seen. Uh, you're right, you know, he, he or she has this opportunity to really proclaim the gospel and to get it out there that people are going to hear. And, you know, all it does is talk about what a great singer this guy was. Well, yeah. Just... Leave that to the pundits. Leave that to the, you know, the music reviewers and stuff like that. Oh, I yeah. don't know. I mean, I, I don't have a problem with eulogies. I mean, I uh, because I don't know how you do a song without talking about the person. You know. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I, I I often you know talk about how the and the, but you got to bring it home to the gospel. You got to bring it home to the cross. You got to bring it home to the empty tomb. You can't leave it with just what a great guy this guy was. But, right, exactly. You know, the, the cross has got to be there. The empty tomb has to be there. And that's where it comes down to. Um, I just had a, a, a funeral I did a couple weeks ago, and it was a, uh, a guy who was a builder. He built houses. And so I, I used uh, Psalm 128, unless the Lord builds the house. I thought that was a real natural thing. And so I tied things together of, you know, uh, what he used to build this house and to build this family together and stuff. And I went through it. And then all of a sudden I said, but you know, what? there's one thing I forgot to mention. What about the foundation? What, you know, was this house built on? And then I talked about his faith in Christ and uh, how he wound up coming to our church. And, you know, the kids told me stories of how important his faith life was, was to him and how important his faith life was for his kids. You know, that, you know, he, he said things like, I need to get you there, you know, and that stuff he used to pull to get him with confirmation and stuff. And it was really, it was really kind of fun to talk about. But, you know, that's how I tied that in. Yeah. Right, right. Because, yeah, because then you point to their faith and say, we know that this person had faith because of the way that, that he expressed his faith. And, um, and and so we know that, that we're saved through faith, and so it gives us assurance of salvation. Whereas if you just talk about what a nice guy he is, you know, what happens is, I mean, let's be realistic. People were sitting there and hearing what a nice guy he was, and while it might make him feel good, anybody that, that knew him, they're going, well, yeah, but, you know, and then what you do is you leave him in doubt. Because they go, well, yeah, but he's not talking about all this other stuff, and God knows full well about that other stuff. But if, you know, if you talk about, but he's saved by grace, you know, the resemblance that James Brown has to Jesus is because he wears the righteousness of Christ that was placed on him by Jesus' blood. You know, that's the resemblance. Yep. Oh, well, missed opportunities. Missed opportunities. And that is kind of a, a, a often you very frustrating and sad and, and, and uh, painful thing to see that. Speaking of missed opportunities, um, interesting case down in Florida. We've had these situations before where we've got the Ten Commandments sitting around and uh, people don't. Aren't you happy about it? In this case, the 
Freedom from Religion Foundation in Madison, Wisconsin, is not very happy about these uh, Ten Commandments sitting on the uh, county commission steps, and they want to sue. There's only one problem. They can't find anybody who'll sue. They don't have standing in that county. So they got to have somebody from the county, you know, to name to put on it. And they can't find anybody who'll do it. So my question is, is what if you happen to throw a lawsuit and nobody shows up? I am wondering, <laughs> why are you here? You know, we've talked about it in a previous episode, the whole um, appropriateness of the Ten Commandments monuments in a... Uh, in a courthouse or whatnot. But, uh, you know, here you have a situation where it's there and nobody really cares enough to do anything about it. Um, you, they've quote a couple people in one of the articles uh, connected with this that there's a, a Native American who presumably it sounds like he's a uh, believes in the American Indian religion and um, uh, one of them and there's some Wiccans that aren't real thrilled with it but nobody's really up in arms enough to to sue or, or anything and you know they, they have precedents um, to, to get rid of it if they really wanted to but well, whatever <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I really like this one look in Alan Cook. I love his cover. I don't know why they put it up. Nobody in Dixie County follows them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, that was a great line. That was a great line, you know? Um, <laughs> which is exactly the truth. Nobody follows them. That's why it's all grace. Um, yeah, you know, oh yeah. So you know, we could follow that up, but, uh, yeah, but somebody else, of course, say, well, you know, if we did, it'd be a better world. Um, so I just thought that it was, it was kind of an interesting little comment there. But I just thought it was funny. They can't find anybody willing to go out and, um, you know, be, be party in the lawsuit. Even if they'll pay the lawyer, they, they, they still say, no, we're not interested. Yeah, you know, I got thinking about this. And here's my question. You know, this is seen as a, it's a religious thing or whatever, but, um, one of the arguments in favor of having something like that there is that a lot of our laws are based on the Ten Commandments, right? And um, and so so here's the question: just just looking at it historically, which of course, if you're just looking at it historically, then the people that are really interested in putting it there, they don't want it there because of its historical. Um, interest. You know, they want it there because of its religious interest. But, um, you know, what if you put a, a monument of, like, the Code of Hammurabi there? You know, would that be okay? Or wouldn't it? So, yeah, something to think about, I guess. That's an interesting but, thought, one way or the other. Um, you know, it, it, Again, it comes in to be an interesting situation, and who knows sometimes what you're going to wind up, you know, getting. So, and, and by the way, a, a thank you to James Croft, who um, who actually wrote the article on his blog and submitted it to CrossFeed. Um, so we appreciate your involvement and, and just, uh, you know, see, post your um, stories up and they might make it to the podcast. Thank you for that free plug. Uh, anyway, um, how are your three daughters doing? Right, you have three daughters. Yep, yep, yep. How are they doing? Okay. Yeah, at the end. They're all back in school. Good, good. Dale has three daughters. Some kids have three parents. So <laughs> I, I had to come up with a transition there somehow. I didn't know how I was going to do it. So, uh, you know, um, you can stretch. Yeah, that's a stretch, but. <laughs> Um, yeah, there was uh, a book a few years ago, you may remember, called Heather Has Two Mommies. And it was about this girl, Heather, who had these lesbian partner parents. Well, now Canada has ruled that there can be a child with three parents. This uh, lesbian couple and the um, 
sperm donor for the uh, father there. And uh, they can make up then the, the, the parents of this child with all three names on the birth certificate. And, um, you know, this uh, justice wrote, uh, it is contrary to the child's best interest that he be deprived of legal recognition of the parents of one of his mothers. Um, this sort of thing has cropped up before, and it has always been due to human okay. error. Where is it going to stop? It takes a village, you know. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, will the future ones say Jacob and Bilha and Zilpa and Rachel and Leha? <laughs> when will this insanity end? You know, <clears throat> all right. I can understand wanting to have some kind of recognition, all right, this... Regardless of the morality of the relationship of these two women, right? They are both caring for him. And, you know, he ends up in the hospital. But one of these two people that he sees as his parent can't come visit him in the hospital because only family members are allowed in the ICU. All right, well, that's not right. That's not fair to him. It's not fair to the, the parents who are taking care of him. But at the same time, there are better ways to, to, you know, to do this, to, um, to recognize, uh, these people's involvement in his life instead of, um, uh, instead of just saying, well, he's got three parents. And, you know, it's not like we're talking about, you know, sure, I, you know, I've got three parents. My um, my parents are divorced. My dad remarried. Uh, uh, it's not quite the same thing um, because this would be the equivalent of giving my stepmother some sort of, uh, of legal, well, I, I'm not even sure what legal uh, uh connection there is there with me but they're not married so <clears throat> I guess what I would like to see and this you know this is kind of an idea that I've kind of batted around is the problem with when you have these sort of civil unions and stuff like that is that you're saying that certain relationships um, get special recognition even though they're not married. But like, you know, say you have you have two lesbians, all right, and and they have the civil union and it's it's practically a marriage. Okay. But then say you've got two um like roommates who have been friends since they were kids, they grew up together, neither one of them marries. Um they're not gay. And in fact they could even be, you know, a man and a woman who have a purely platonic relationship. And, and just happen to, um, you know, to share space. And, um, and then they have this really close, like, family relationship. And, and, and so my suggestion, there's no theology behind us, um, but what about some sort of honorary family thing? Where you could sign a thing saying, this person is like brother than or, or you can, you know, define a relationship according to one. But to say they're like family in the sense that um, in, if I'm in uh, intense care or where only family is allowed or, you know, a situation like that, that um, I would want them to be able to come to this. And, you know, they'd have to nail out how that works out when you get into things like custody and inheritance and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that would eliminate the sort of special status given to homosexuals that they can have civil unions, but, um, but platonic relationships, heterosexual, um, you know, uh, you know, you can't have, you can't have a heterosexual civil union. Why don't we just have, you know, uh, registered domestic partnerships? Yeah. Yeah. Something, you know, call them that, you know, 
Well, going back to the story, you know, what's the problem is what's magical about tea? What's where are you going to stop? And if you allow gay people to be married, well, probably, you know, then where do you stop again? I mean, why, what's the event? Three people, four people. I mean, what what basis are you know? And there's already articles and in, in people struggling uh, with that issue of of, of uh, what they call polyamory, uh, uh, multi-love. Uh, it, it, it's a issue, you know, it's going to be a very difficult issue for society to face when people think, oh, it's not going to happen. Questions are already happening. I right? um, was talking to the pastor. He's getting his uh, doctorate on. I think it's Duke. At Duke University, and uh, so uh, and there's some you know church people from all kinds of different uh, religious backgrounds there, not just uh, uh, Missouri Synod, and uh, some of them very open in favor of, uh, of uh, marriage of gay and lesbian people. And then one of them said, "From <laughs> yeah, I said I'm going to do this one," and he said, "Oh yeah, there's three of us." And he all of a sudden, you know, I had to, you know, begin to think about my you know, things I'm doing, you know, the, 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 the blessings and stuff that I was doing. Because all of a sudden, you know, now can I do it? So it, it's a struggle, and I think it's going to be something we're going to have trouble thinking through and, and seeing how it goes. And you know, it's going to make life and ministry more interesting. That's so, for sure. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm at the halfway point, you know. I've got 20 more years and I get to retire, you know, so. Um, but the guys who are just getting out today, they're going to have to deal with it for the next 40 years. But I remember you know, when I was, when I was on Vicarage, which is a, um, for those who don't know, it's a internship, it's third year of seminary. Um, my supervising pastor who was, uh, planning on retiring within just a, like a year or two, uh, after I was there, um, he says to me, I'm glad I'm getting out of the ministry now. And my heart goes out to you that you're just going into it. <laughs> and that was, what, um, eight and a half years ago? Yeah, he told me that years. back in 1985. When I, when I was, <laughs> uh, was just starting out, he says, I'm glad I'm getting out. He says, you're going to be in a lot more difficult ministry than I ever thought about. He said, uh, you know, you, there's some challenges ahead that you're really going to struggle with. And he's right. It's getting very complex. Well, keeps it interesting, that's for sure. Well, at and least what the... you don't have to worry about somebody spying on us. <laughs> this has become a really huge story. And it should um, be. Yeah, well, um, we have a, a bishop who was... Um, the newly appointed Archbishop of Warsaw, his name is Stanislaw Wilgis, and apologies to um, anyone who knows Polish, because I probably didn't pronounce that right. Um, he admitted that he had collaborated with Poland's communist-era secret police. And um, so he resigned right after being appointed. Now, this is kind of a series of stories uh, that were put up on Crosby because first uh, he was um, he was accused of it and he denied it, and then the documents came out that proved that he had, and so then he um, he admitted it and uh, and he resigned. And then, like, what, a day later, a second prominent Catholic clergyman resigned um, for the same reason. This was uh, uh, the Reverend Janice Bilansky resigned as rector of Krakow's prestigious Wawo Cathedral, which is a burial place of Polish kings and queens. So, uh, yeah, same thing. Now, this was um, the the main one that we're talking about was involved in this for about 20 years. 
um, starting in the late 60s and so through the late 80s until the fall of the Soviet Union. You know, the sad thing is because is there was this kind of, kind of picture on you know, people's mind that the church was this bastion against the communist regime. You know, it was, it was the place where they fought. And here you had basically, you know, this, this informer, you know, hiding in and, 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 you know, informing people what's going on and, uh, you know, being in, working as an informant. And it was a really, uh, horrible, it's, you know, thing. And it would probably shook the, 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 the church and the confidence of the people. But, mm-hmm. You know, yeah, and they had to get, I don't know what kind of spying he was doing on other priests, you know, and possibly the Solidarity Movement, and who knows what else. Right. So, yeah, you know, it really, you know, here's the thing, when pastors on any level, but, you know, the higher up they are, the um, the more this is true, when they're involved in any kind of thing that breaks the public trust, it just completely destroys their ministry because people have to trust the, um, you know, this is somebody that they go to for all of those really big problems in their lives and all the really big events. You know, the pastors are there for, um, for their, for their births or their, um, or at least their baptism, their, um, Weddings, funerals, you know, all those, those big events in their lives, those milestone events. And, um, and they, they count on them to be there to, for them to help them through the hard times and to, to rejoice with them in the good times. And then you have something like this come along and wow, it just destroys your credibility. Mm-hmm. So now, interesting, you know, this reminded me though, of the um, the Diocletian persecution. Um, now remember that they these this guy we don't know what kind of pressure he was under to to give this information. You know we can't just assume that that he called them up and said, "Hey, let me help you out." You know, chances are if these guys were in prominent positions. Um, they probably had guns held to their heads at some point and said, you're going to help us out. You got it. Um, or at least it was implied. And because um, that's the way the Soviet Union operated. Now, that doesn't excuse it because, you know, at that point, if that was the case, they should have said, sorry, then go ahead and I'll go to heaven and, you know, I'll be good. But, uh, and... Something kind of similar happened um, back in the Roman Empire that um, Emperor Diocletian was persecuting Christians and told them that they had to turn in um, all of their Bibles and, and other um, documents, uh, religious documents. And, um, you know, this is before the printing press and where you had, you know, nowadays you have Bibles on every, being handed out for free on street corners and everything else. Um, they're everywhere. You couldn't possibly get rid of all of them, right? But the idea was, we're just going to get rid of all the Bibles, and that'll stop Christianity. So a number of, you know, because these things had to be hand-copied, only the prominent clergy had copies of them. And so they would, um, a number of them handed them in because they didn't want to die. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then after things settled down, then, you know, these guys have been kicked out of the church for doing this. They wanted to come back. And what it did is it raised a lot of questions. Well, okay, this guy renounced Christianity, basically. Um, Do we, uh, first of all, do we let him back? And, okay, well, before, in the time, did the, the sacraments that, that they performed, were they valid? Um, and, uh, you know, it just led to all kinds of questions. It's also the origin of the doctrine of penance. I did not know that. Because what they did is when they came back, they said, all right, you're forgiven. 
But we need to make a point of showing that this is a really serious thing. It, it, it was really harmful to the church. And so here's, you know, you, God forgives you, but you need the people's forgiveness too. And so what they would have to do is be things like um, they have to sit on the church steps on Sunday when the people were coming to church and beg for their forgiveness and do this for like, and I'd, I'd have to go back and see how long, but it was like weeks or months that they'd have to do this. And um, so nowadays it's the understanding of it has really changed, but that's how it got started. Well, it's and, sort of um, a very basic idea, restitution. Right. You know, or, you know, it's a really good idea. I mean, if I have people, you know, confess things to me, one of the things I ask you, how you going, what kind of restitution are you going to make? You know, and I think that's all I think mean, restitution is a good idea and try to, when you can do that and things and it just got to be really formalized. Uh, sometimes, by the way, it, some of them, of course, had to go away for a period of 40 days and be by themselves and then they were in quarantine. So that term came out of that they were, uh, uh, stuck aside for 40, but, you know, yeah, there is. I think there is a similar thing and I think these guys you know, rightly need to do an act of penance. I'm glad um, that, um, you know, he resigned. I mean, that's the right thing to do in this case. That, I think, shows, you know, true contrition. I realize what I've yep. done is wrong. Um, yeah. Now it's that important to note that, Well, yeah. <laughs> but it's important to note, though, that when we're talking about restitution... That it's all right. You're forgiven. God forgives you, and there's nothing you can do to make up for it. As far as God is concerned, He already made up for it. All right? But you know what? There's people that have been hurt, and you owe those people something, and you can't you can't make up for it with them either. But you can help them. You know, you can you can undo um, the, some of the damage that's been done. Or at least show them, you know, so that they can trust you again. Show them that you really mean it. So, but yeah, you have to be real careful with that. Um, so that make sure they understand this is not about whether God forgives you or not. But at the same time, you know, it's right to do it because it, we, we, you know, accepting a natural consequence of your actions again should. Shows the repentance there. So a lot of times we want to, you know, we don't want to have to deal with the consequences. You know, we really want to be a, come on, can't we just move on? And the answer is that sometimes, no, you can't just move on. Mm. So, yeah, well, that's pretty much the show for this week. And, uh, but a lot of interesting situations here to deal with. And we'll continue on this story and see what's going on. Dale, how do people get a hold of us? Well, Jim, they can get a hold of us a number of different ways. What uh, are they, Jesus. Dale? <laughs> you can call us on our voicemail line at area code 206-202-0819. And by the way, if you're in a, another country, um, you can always just uh, use something like Skype and Skype out to get a hold of us that way. Or you can just send us an MP3 recording of your um, of your message, and you can send that or a text, uh, you know, a standard email or however you want to do it uh, to crossfeed at gmail dot com. And uh, and while we're talking about contacting us, uh, I also want to just send a big shout out to I was. Um, we have statistics uh, as far as where our feed is going and, and, and who's actually watching and listening. We don't actually know who the people are, but we know what countries um, they are. And we've got a lot of listeners in China. So a big shout-out to our listeners in China. I'm really thrilled that you can uh, hear us. And, and, and thanks for tuning in. And share this with your friends. Uh, lots in the UK and a lot of viewers in Japan. 
And so I, I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, so, hi, because most of our Japanese viewers are watching us, not listening. So I um, also want to send a thank you to our sponsor, tdaperformance.com. Uh, if you have a Palm OS device, uh, they make software for it, uh, productivity software, and uh, some really good stuff. So if you haven't had a chance, go and check them out. So um, also, uh, our, I've finally figured out how to get our episodes up on YouTube.com. And uh, so uh, if anybody's watching this on YouTube, hi. Just Why don't you just subscribe to the podcast right away? So that, um, <laughs> so that you can get all the rest of our episodes. And, uh, and we're also up on Google Video and um, AOL Video. Uh, although on AOL Video, uh, they're not seeing this right now uh, because you can only put the first seven minutes of it, so it's more like a teaser. But uh, So anybody that's not actually uh, getting the main podcast feed but is watching us somewhere else, um, Hi, and, uh, and thanks for watching. Go subscribe. And you can always go to our webpage, crossfeednews.com. Uh, look at stories, vote on stories, comment on stories, and submit stories. It was great to have one of uh, the stories this week that we did a submission that wasn't by Dale or myself. Um, and, yeah. you know, those ones that uh, are there, we want to cover. So uh, please uh, use our website. Uh, contact us. Uh, we do thank you for listening. Um, I'm yeah. very a lot amazed of, people I are. Have to, there was, um, I, I got a question. Uh, somebody came to our site and said, and, and I had said something about going there and, and, and getting involved, participating, and they were looking for a forum, like a, just a standard web forum. All right, we don't have that. Um, what we do have is you find a news story that's interesting, and there's, you can leave a comment afterward. And um, what we'd really love to get going is just some conversations about these news stories, besides just Jim and me talking um, through the podcast, to actually have um, people leave their comments and, and say, what do you think about these stories? And, uh, you know, get some conversations going. It would give us, you know, and we'd be happy to share those conversations um, as part of the podcast too, if we get some interesting um, conversations going there, so um, so go and uh, and post your comments. Tell us what you think. Tell everybody else what you think. So, thank you everybody for for tuning in, for watching, for listening. However you're getting us, and uh, good night. Good night, and God bless you. This week on CrossFeed. Pat Roberts. Sorry, Pat. Sorry, hold on. Sorry, I'll, I'll do this.